my name is Tom Mitchell, or have been the music director for a number of shows uh, with the Gilbert and Sullivan Society uh, off and on over the last 10 years. And how did you become a part of, uh, of the Gilbert and Sullivan Society? Oh, that's uh, quite a long, interesting story, actually. Um, as you can probably tell from the funny way I talk, uh, I wasn't born in Canada. I was actually born in Glasgow in Scotland long time ago. And uh, I came to Canada to Toronto in 1976. And uh, having already been very active uh, in uh, community theatre of various types back in Scotland, I, uh, after I got settled, uh, sought out a local group and joined a group called Scarborough Choral Society. A number of people in that group were also Gilbert and Sullivan fans and were involved with the Toronto Gilbert and Sullivan Society, which at that time was a performing society. And uh, now they really are just a, a, an organization with an interest in Gilbert and Sullivan and regular monthly meetings. Uh, however, it was through my involvement with the Toronto Gilbert and Sullivan Society that I met Adrian back in Toronto. Uh, I was with the Scarborough Choral Society as their music director for 15 years and moved to Victoria in 1996. And uh, at some point after uh, arriving here and getting myself uh, more than well organized, because I think it was, might have been, must have been 2005, I got a phone call from Adrian asking me if I was interested in being the music director for the upcoming production of The Gondoliers, which I, after some consideration, decided I would do. And I've uh, gone on and worked with the society uh, off and on since then. And I haven't even counted them up, but I think it's in the region of five or six productions. What's your experience been like with uh, like going from Toronto uh, to, to Victoria and joining the Victoria Gilbert and Sullivan Society? How, how was that? Uh, good question. There's a great deal of similarity I mean, in community theatre groups, uh, it's certainly the ones I've been involved with, which is uh, two or three different ones here in, in BC and maybe about five or six back in Scotland. They're all completely run and organised by uh, very dedicated volunteers who have a great interest in theatre but in very few cases are uh, full-time professional performers. There are people with various degrees of talent in the many different genres that are needed to put a full production on, whether it's singing on stage, organizing behind the scenes, rehearsal accompanists, set builders, choreographers, you, you name it. You need all kinds of different people with different talents. And quite often those people are, are very talented people, but not necessarily people who make their living with those talents. Um, so I always found that a very interesting experience. You make many new friends, as I did uh, with the Victoria Gilbert and Sullivan Society. And there was probably two things that, that uh, came uh, that come to mind here around the Victoria group. Uh, one was I was certainly always impressed with how much they could achieve with so little. They had uh, li very limited financial resources available to them and yet they used to build some incredible sets uh, with very small um, budgets, uh, costumes, all, all provided and produced with very small budgets. And that's not always the case in many shows. In fact, one of the first organizations I, or I joined back in Scotland um, at that time, they actually rented all their costumes, uh, as did the Toronto Gilbert and Sullivan Society. And that's a huge expense. So the, the society is uh, very, um, very lucky uh, to, to have so many talented people available to take on those things on a, on a volunteer basis. So when I first arrived in Victoria and took on the job with uh, uh, the Gilbert Sullivan Society, it was a great uh, pleasure and privilege for me to understand that they work with a professional orchestra, which allowed uh, many uh, things to happen much more readily, not the least of which was um, considerably fewer rehearsals because with professional players, they show up to rehearsal knowing the part and are able to sight read it perfectly. And so you can get immediately to what I call the real job of making music. Because if anyone who's worked with me in the chorus will have heard me say, we can't even start until everybody knows the notes. 
rehearsals are not for learning notes. Rehearsals are for turning it into music. And uh, we do, we do uh, obviously have to do some note learning. And so we do that first and we have to build that into the schedule for the singers. Uh, but with the orchestra, uh, when we're using a professional orchestra, that makes my job so much easier. And that was just a, a selfish pleasure, if you will, that uh, I gained by working with the Gilbert and Sullivan Society. Do you have any favorite memories from uh, for being in the Victoria Gilbert and Sullivan Society? But I probably have a couple of moments that, that, that uh, come to mind. There's many uh, memorable moments from, from different shows. Um, uh, one of the most recent ones that comes to mind, which fits right in with the, well, the one I'm working on, uh, was the finale of Act One from our most recent Mikado. From a purely musical perspective, uh, even though the, the, the visual aspect was, was equally awesome, but I really enjoyed that finale and felt that the, the group did a magnificent job of, of performing that finale and, and uh, should be very proud with what they achieved. Another one uh, that comes to mind, uh, if I'm not taking up too much of your time, uh, a story about uh, a tenor. Now, we've been especially lucky in the last three shows uh, because of our relationship with Benjamin Butterfield, who heads up the voice department at the uh, University of, Vict of Victoria, who was himself a, a very excellent professional tenor. I remember seeing him in, uh, as Nanki Poo in the Mikado at Stratford many, many years ago. Uh, we have a relationship with him and uh, he has been able to send some of his top students our way who are willing to put in the time to appear with us and, and gain the experience, uh, which, which Benjamin likes them to have as well, if they can fit it into the schedule, because it's one of the few places they can get the opportunity to uh, rehearse and, and prepare a complete role in a full production with the live orchestra. And one of the first times that happened was, I don't know, it must be eight years or more ago now, was a production of HMS Pinafer. And uh, um, Caden Fosberg was the, the student of Benjamin at the time who came and auditioned for uh, the role of Rafe Rackstraw. And there's a whole story around there I won't go into. But during rehearsals, there was one particular moment, anybody who knows Pinafer, there's a song for the tenor near the beginning that ends with, and, and, and that's thus my lowly suitor. And on the word suitor, he sings a high note. It's an A if you read music. And at one particular rehearsal, without any direction from me, Caden sang that note in full open chest voice, a beautiful, big, uh, uh, fully projected sound, and then proceeded to do what is the most difficult thing for any trained singer to do, which is to effortlessly and seamlessly, over a short period of time, produce a very even diminuendo down to a very soft sound and then maintained the soft sound before he finished the word into the last syllable. That is so difficult to do and very much what I always wanted in that song, but could never get it. And I went bananas and I went up to him and said, oh, can you do that every time? And, and um, Linda Tok, who was at the rehearsal, uh, came over to me at the pub after rehearsal and said, what on earth were you so excited about? So I, I explained to her what I've just explained here, but it's, it was just a beautiful moment I've never forgotten. And what is your favorite show? Well, if you ask Adrian, he'll answer that for you in a flash, and a few, there's a few other people know it too. And not only is it not a show that Gilbert and Sullivan in Victoria have never done, it's a show that I have never either performed in or had the pleasure of conducting, and it's called Princess Ida. Uh, it's, uh, I won't guess because Adrian will pick me up on it. It, it. It's around the middle of the 14 shows that they wrote. And um, I personally consider that it's the best musically. It may not, it's not a bad story. There are other, there are other um, or ones that are not, uh, they're a little more, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Too esoteric or something like that. Um, the, the thing that Sullivan never liked when they weren't realistic shows. But Princess Ida is relatively realistic, uh, but the music is absolutely wonderful. It's, it's also the only show they wrote that has three acts. It has one short act, one regular length act, and then a third short act. And uh, the, the big finale that Sullivan always wrote was always for the end of act one. They were typically a good 15, 20 minutes of music, whereas he would 
anybody who knows the history, Sullivan was a great procrastinator and often rattled off a few things and literally in the last few days before the new production opened. And so this finales of act two are often very short. Everything's just suddenly resolved and a very short finale and then we're done. But in Princess Ida, the big finale is at the end of act two, which is the full length act. And in my opinion, it's uh, very close, if not slightly above the finale of Act One of Mikado. One of the things that I've suggested that may or may not ever happen is that if we, if the group ever does some concerts, because I, I think if, if, the, if our audience could be exposed to some of this magnificent music, um, oh, I, one thing I forgot to tell you, there's a, a common saying, in that second act I was talking about, there's uh, a series of numbers that are referred to as the string of pearls. And it's because each number is magnificent in its own right. And it's one after the other after, the, you know, sometimes in a Gilbert and Sullivan show, you can pick your favorite. So there's a wonderful piece here and a wonderful piece there. And you know, mm -hmm. a couple in the middle are, they're okay because Sullivan didn't ever really do anything bad, uh, but some are better than others. But there's three numbers in a row in act two of Princess Ida that are all top notch. Do you have any any final words for uh, young participants uh, that might be interested in going into the Gilbert and Sullivan Society? Well, first of all, as with any endeavor, uh, the up and coming youth are uh, the future. And without them, there is no future. So it's very important to find some way to get these people involved and wanting to come out and participate in these productions or they simply will not continue. So I think there's a there's an onus on the existing members as well that when we manage to uh, get some of those people to come and join us that we encourage them and help them along and make sure we teach them the ropes just like any apprenticeship program so that they're equipped to take over the society because 20, 25 years from now, none of us will be here, or at least I won't, you, you probably will. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, we need, we need to keep the future of the society in mind um, there's a, a, a balance there between um, um, people having an interest in it and having, uh, how can I put this politely, sufficient talent. You don't have to be a Pavarotti or a Domingo or whoever your favorite opera singer is to come and join a group like the Gilbert and Sullivan Society. You don't even need to be what many people would consider, you know, a really good singer. You basically only need to be able to hold the tune. and something many people don't realize is people will tell you, oh, I can't sing, I'm tone deaf. Tone deaf, truly tone deaf is a very, very rare physical situation. It's, it's uh, almost, uh, it almost certainly does not apply to most people who think they are tone deaf and you can learn uh, uh, to sing. You don't have to have a wonderful voice to, to join our chorus. You need to be able to blend with other singers. And this is where we need to, make sure uh, new people are helped. Um, how we get the word out is more of a marketing thing than, than uh, uh, an apprenticeship thing. And I'll leave that to people who have expertise in that area. But somehow you need to do something that makes it attractive for these people to come and join. In terms of the society itself, you know, given the situation we're all in right now, uh, we all hope that this uh, COVID virus gets dealt with as quickly as possible and we get back to being able to uh, uh, both uh, perform ourselves at the community theatre level as well as enjoying the professional uh, productions that some of us enjoy watching here in, in Victoria, uh, like Pacific Opera, etc. All of that is on hold right now. Um, I would hope that the society, when it's ready to get going again, can find a way to move forward. Um, the, as you know, the last two attempts to mount a full-scale production both resulted in insufficient interest uh, to be able to cast the show and somehow all of that needs to be resolved and uh, i'm not suggesting i have a magic answer to that um, but one thing that i would suggest is worth considering is that the first step when when the ability to perform is opened up again might be to do something quickly but make it a make it a high quality concert uh, with the full orchestra, but so that you can quickly get an audience uh, to hear that the, the Gilbert and Sullivan Society is a quality level group. 
and don't necessarily try and go straight to doing a big production. And what is your favorite uh, quote from any any of the shows that you've done? What's a favorite quote or song uh, verse that you enjoy? Uh, the, the thing that comes to mind is not necessarily a, a favorite quote of mine, but a very apt quote. Uh, when Sullivan died, and he died before Gilbert did, they went to Gilbert and asked him for a suitable uh, quote for Sullivan's epitaph. And he quoted to him from um, Yeoman of the Guard, is life a boon? And, and he went on to quote the whole thing, which ends with, with um, uh, because the life's been taken away too soon. I can't remember, but it, it, it talks about, uh, about dying too soon. And it was a very apt quote for Sullivan's uh, um, gravestone. Tom, thank you so much for this opportunity to uh, get your opinions uh, on the Victoria Gilbert and Sullivan Society. Thank you very You're much. Welcome. Thanks for inviting me. Bye. All right. Bye-bye.